corner of the city is being simply turned by this building that uh, takes on this almost nautilus shell type form in order to maximize the length of offices that look at the marvelous view in all directions but the shape of the building just naturally turns the corner of the built up part of the uh, of the city Back in 1985, just before construction began, the site looked like this. Bernacci Winwood first became involved with Number no. 1 Spring Street when the Shell Company invited development proposals from three developers and at the same time architectural proposals from five or six architects. We were involved as structural engineers for Grollo's development proposal and when they won the project, we joined the final project team along with Harry Seidler as architect who was chosen out of the parallel architectural submissions. In this instance, Grollo the builder is also the building owner. Project manager for the construction, Stan Falloon. Due to the fact that the underground rail loop was in close proximity to the site, the foundations that were located alongside the underground rail loop had to be drilled down beneath the base of the underground rail loop. The main caisson is designed to take a safe working load of 4,600 tonnes and from the existing ground level was sleeved through sandstone and siltstone below the Melbourne Underground Rail Loop Authority easement, the overall depth being 45 metres. The caisson supporting three columns spanning through the main entrance area is at 70 MPA the highest strength concrete ever specified on a building project in Australia. In fact, the characteristic strength obtained exceeded the specified 70 MPA by as much as 20 MPA. The overall reason for the high strength concrete was to ensure no load was applied to the underground rail loop structures. Excavation to the main tower core is now nearing completion. It is expected within the next two days to commence reinforcing steel. In a pour lasting about eight hours, some 870 cubic metres of concrete went into the main core foundation, for which about 85 tonnes of reinforcing steel was used. The spinal cord of the building, or the service core, was constructed by the use of a jump form using the Lubecker system of multiple lifting points. Construction of the shell house core walls, which contain the lift shafts and various service areas, use high strength 60 MPA concrete to minimize wall thicknesses. About 100 cubic meters was poured for each floor. Once floor construction was started, labor was able to move between the core and the floor work faces, leading to some economies of labor. At first, uh, everybody threw their hands up saying, you know, uh, curved buildings sound terribly difficult to make. But the more we discussed how to actually construct the building, the more it was realized that we don't really have uh, so many irregularities in the building, that all the columns are really the same, that all the spandrels, all the spans from one column to another are the same. Uh, that makes for mass production. So one can, in fact, make uh, factory-produced components or formwork for floors uh, that take on quite unusual shapes in quite a simple way. 
So uh, I, I must say the, the, the way the building is going the, the, together and the way it's been organized is admirable, to say the least. The builder elected to precast the high-quality finish external columns at the Tors Adelaide Yard. This enabled considerable savings in both time and the erection of special scaffolding. Being precast, the columns were able to be positioned and grouted quickly and without any interruption to other work. Grollo, in fact, elected to precast some 50% of the construction elements in Shell House. This simplified much of the construction process, including the use of precast spandrels. These were required to have a high quality granite finish, but for monolithic behavior and because of weight, they were cast with only a 100 to 180 millimeter thick outer face with reinforcing ferrules for connection to the in situ beam. The expense of formwork and special scaffolding was avoided again by the loss form approach and the polished granite finish is best quality. Lost form or permanent formwork precast panels was used for the walls and external wing wall. By precasting, Grollo was assured of manufacturer ahead of requirement and of factory control over finish quality. Prefabrication also reduces time consuming operations at the work face, while the incorporation of precast with in situ construction elements provides a monolithic structure and more tolerances. Well, the fluid form of the building, the fact that it facets around into a curved shape, is, of course, uh, not only sculpturally appealing to me, I think it certainly gets away from the shoebox sort of architecture that uh, I think most people are getting tired of. Uh, but by having chosen that form, which responds to the uh, needs of the site and the occupants, we are confronted with the problem of constructing it in permanent materials. And to, for that uh, form, that uh, curvilinear form of the building, concrete is the only, if not uh, the, the most ideal material to be used. I mean, steel does come in straight sticks, in long, straight elements. One can curve it, of course, but that's tedious. Whereas concrete, which is put poured into uh, timber forms can be given virtually any shape. The shape of the building created a complication in that virtually no two bays were identical. There were 38 table form sections for a typical floor which averaged in area about 1,100 square meters. Because of a limited working face and to save more time, steel reinforcement cages were formed off-site and delivered as complete assemblies. Additional lacing bars were required to permit handling without distortion. The extra material cost was more than offset by the time saving and by evening the demands on steel fixing crews. Another advantage is the reduction of on-site labor numbers. The industry is now offering other methods, including special and pre-bent fabrics, while various references and services are available to help those wishing to utilize these techniques. To span the 14.7 meters across the floor, two pre-stressing tendons were used in each beam, one being stressed from each end. These were subsequently partially stressed at an age of three days to enable formwork to be removed. The tendons were prefabricated at Structural Systems Campbellfield, then transported to the working deck as completed tendons. Although previously restricted to low-level structures, lightweight concrete was pumped with ease to the uppermost levels of Shell House. Lightweight concrete was used to minimize foundation weight and proved to be ideally suited to the pre-stressed slabs, providing strengths of 15 MPA at 48 hours and 20 MPA at 72 hours. After each floor was poured and parsley stressing was completed, the tables were dropped and moved to a point where the crane could pick them up using a simple connection device which avoided excessive swaying and was very safe to operate. With the tables out of the way, back propping for future concreting operations became simple and open 
and final stressing was accomplished before the floor above was poured. Following services such as air conditioning, computer floors, ceilings and electricals were able to move in much earlier than normal. The crews on the Shell House site were made up essentially of carpenters, labourers and a couple of welders. Even pre-stressing was done by Grollo's own labour force. When compared to crew requirements for steel fabricated constructions, which need a more diverse crew, including riggers, steel welders and fire protection sprayers, the steel reinforcement team is not dependent on specialists, who if one or two are absent, can delay a whole site. The tables were the bulkiest items, and they were lifted only four metres vertically before being taken back onto the deck. With detailed planning and time efficient techniques, the complexities of Shell House were soon simplified. Let's take a speed view of a typical construction cycle. 4 day turnaround was achieved on several occasions on the Shell House site. Quite a remarkable feat when you consider the unusual shape of the building, the fact that there was only one set of table forms and that slab spans varied. The facade of course is concrete used in a very very special way, quite unique way, and that is to make components in the factory of concrete, a very special concrete that has aggregate in it made of granite which is then polished and as you can see a reconstructed granite building responding to these curved forms and again that can only be achieved in, in the concrete material. And it's with very great pleasure that I now formally declare Shell House open for business. Uh, its amenities for the people of Shell, I think, have not only contributed something to the community as a whole, but to the people who work in the building, who uh, have got uh, uh, facilities uh, given to them and spaces to enjoy, which are, I think are quite unique by Australian standards. Therefore, it gives me great pleasure to announce the winners for the 1989 Bomer Award, the Grollo Group for Shell House, and the National Australia Bank for the Knoxfield Centre. Shell House is a fine example of what is possible when designers and builders work together. They can, with original thinking and careful pre-planning, bring quickly to fruition in concrete what might have been considered a vague possibility, just a pipe dream.